I hope that you're buckled up today because today we're going on a ride that's going to blow your mind. If you're serious about learning a tonal language, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese, Lao, Burmese, you need to watch this clip to the end. You will learn more about tones and tonal languages than you could ever imagine. And it might just make learning tonal languages that much easier for you. So what if I told you that Chinese, Thai, Lao, Vietnamese, Burmese, all run on the same tonal system. Now, politics tend to divide languages more than linguistic differences. And this is especially so when it comes to tonal languages. One of the things over the years that it's made it easier for me to learn tonal languages is because I understand how tones work. So in English, when we think of the word tone, you're probably thinking of pitch. And if you've done my tones masterclass, if you haven't, click on the link below. But you would have learned that tones are not pitch contours. Pitch is just a byproduct of tone. When it comes to tonal languages, like between Mandarin and Cantonese or Thai and Lao, people start comparing numbers of tones, which to me is crazy. Once you understand the system, you would never compare the actual number of tones as even a thing to worry about or concern yourself with when you're learning the language. It's like me as an Australian going to the UK. I look up in the sky and I say, huh, look, your clouds look like pumpkins. In Australia, we have clouds that look like kangaroos, like elephants, like tomatoes. But look, you've just got cauliflower and pumpkins in your sky. That's what tone comparison is like. It's not the shape or the pitch contour that makes it difficult or harder. It's what that tone actually is. So when you look up into the sky and you see a cloud take whatever shape, you know that that's just been like a combination of the wind and how high it is and all of these different elements. And it just happened to randomly be that shape at that point in time. That is tones. So when we say tone in English, many people think of pitch. Pitch is just a byproduct, just like that shape of a cloud. But what are tones then? So if I write the word for tone here in Chinese, so we've got this sound coming to the ear, and this word here in Mandarin is sheng seng in Cantonese. In Vietnamese, we use this word tiang, which is the same word. And in Thai, we actually have this same word, which is siang. Now, in Vietnamese, you will also have this word um, being rendered as this word here, tang. And often you'll see it with this word here in Vietnamese. Uh, diu. So tain diu is the same as this word here in Chinese. So sheng diao. So diao is a degree or a marker or an index. Sheng is the voice. Xiang is voice in Thai as well. All from this same root word in the Sinitic languages. So sheng, seng, tiang, tain, xiang. All the same word meaning the voice. Okay, and then you have the word diao, diao. What does that mean? In Chinese, it means an indicator or an index, a marker. And actually, when you're talking about the tones in Vietnamese, we have this other word here, um, zo. And so you might have the zo na, and that means a marker as well. So it's pretty much the same meaning of this. Nothing within these two characters here, or these two words, has anything to do with pitch. It's all about degrees of the voice or degrees of the throat, the physiology of the voice, not about the actual pitch contour. And in fact, this is Marvin Brown's book from Ancient Scripts. You can see there are some Thai dialects, T-A-I dialects, where the same tone could have two different pitch contours within the same dialect, just depending on how they speak, because it's all about the mechanics of the mouth. And so you can see this is just the normal tone, which in Chinese would be ping sheng, and the pitch contour may go this way or it may go that way. Depends. And to a native speaker of that dialect, they wouldn't bat an eyelid if you said it one way or the other because they're listening for the nature of the voice. In Sukho Tai Tai, this is reconstructed from around 800 years ago. You can see the same thing. So this was normal voice 
And so if we were in Chinese tones, we have ping shang chu ru. We'll look at that in a second. That would actually be ping chu shang and then ru are these two dead. That's long dead and short dead. So these are the high class in Thai. So we'll learn in a moment that these are actually the ones that are unvoiced and they'd be in a higher register of the voice. But your pitch contour might go up, it might go down. It doesn't matter. Just as long as the voice was in this normal relaxed state, uh, because it was aspirated, it would have been placed in a higher place. These middle ones are ones where you had this stopped throat at the beginning. And so the voice just tended to place those in the middle range when it came to the actual pitch. And then these ones, they were all voiced. And so the voice by nature just dropped down lower. And so this is the same as the yin and yang tones in Mandarin. And so just as long as your voice had this natural state to it, the characteristic of what that syllable was would have put it into a different position in your throat, but then the pitch contour could have gone either way. This is Southern Thai from 1450, so a couple of hundred years later, but you can see it's also very similar. These tones could have gone either way. So just remember, it's not about pitch. Pitch is just the byproduct. So where do tones come from? Well, have a look at this. If I have the word here, I'm just going to do, this is an unaspirated K. So, okay, it's not K. So that would be ga. So in Thai, we might write this like this. Okay, ga. In pinyin, we use the G to represent this unaspirated K in Hanyu pinyin. Okay, so I'll just write it there for the moment. So if this were um, Chinese pinyin, you read a G in pinyin, it's actually an unaspirated K. So this would be ga, my throat is closed, ga. So I wanna show you a couple of things. Watch what happens if I now, now in IPA, we use a question mark here to be a glottal stop. So ga, 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 what's happening to my throat? Ga, like wa, -a, wa, -a, ga, ga, that glottal stop is pulling my voice up. So ga, so this is normal voice. I'll write it here, normal. This one is a glottal stop. So ga, and it pulls the voice up before this stop here. So originally Chinese was not a tonal language. So supposing I had, uh, let me just draw a coin here. This is a coin representing money, or a transaction, okay? I'm just gonna put this here. And so we just have this, and I'm going to say this has this funny syllable ma. Okay, it's, this is not historical. I'm just using ma as an example, okay? So what happened in Chinese is that we had prefixes at the end or prefixes, suffixes, prefix comes at the beginning, suffix at the end, infix in between. So supposing we had a suffix then where we want to say any transaction that say this is a person here that comes toward a person is going to have this glottal stop at the end. So ma just means transaction or money. And then we have ma, that means that that money is coming towards me. And then supposing we have this next one here. So rather than a glottal stop at the end, I'm going to put an S at the end. So this would be gas. Okay, so let me just write this here. Ga. Now, if I do a short vowel, this is a short a. Uh, by nature, it's a glottal stop because if I don't stop it in my throat, ga, ga, it becomes long. So this represents a glottal stop too, to have a short vowel. And then gas, okay? So gas, this S at the end, and I'm going to put here gas. Now try saying the S sound. You have to puff almost like an H over your tongue, which is sort of locked in place here. And so this is why in Spanish, Espanol, Espanol, sometimes an S even becomes an H. And so what happens, this is air puffing over like this, and this becomes almost an H. So this is called aspiration, okay? And so aspiration. And so for our imaginary language here, I'm going to make it so that S at the end actually means a transaction going away from here. So here's this, and then this is going away. And so that would be mas or ma. Ma, okay. 
So what we have here is normal voice, ma, just a transaction money, ma, ma, okay, that's the money coming into me, ma, and ma, that's the money going away from me. So in ancient Chinese, this is one grammatical tool that you could use, glottal stop, something coming towards me, aspiration at the end going away. So what happens is this glottal stop, ma, 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 it sort of comes up and then it sort of creaks out here, ma, 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 and that's what turned into the sheng tone, okay? Or in ancient Chinese, sang, which is the rising tone. The rising tone was originally this creaky voice at the end that happened from a glottal stop. And this one here with the aspiration at the end, so that sort of came out and it aspirated out at the end, and in general, it would push the voice down, that's what we call the departing tone uh, in English, or the chu. So we have the sheng is glottal stop or creaky voice, and we have the departing tone chu, which was aspiration at the end. Normal voice was ping. And so this ping just means normal voice. So we have three tones. We have ping, normal, sheng, which was ma, and we had aspiration, ma. And so let me just write that there for the moment. So if for Thai, if you're following this in Thai, which turned into basically this ha, okay? Or you might want to write hona hu, but actually it's more this one here, a ha. So this is aspiration. This is a creaky throat. This is normal voice. We had one more and that might be final K, final P or final T. And basically what happens is as soon as this K hits at the end, P hits the lips or T on the palate. Gut, gut, gut. So this is what we call in Thai, Thai, so dead. I'll write it here, Thai. Um, or in Mandarin, we call this Zhu. So this would be like, written like this in Thai. So we have these dead, normal voice, creaky voice, ga, or aspiration at the end, ga which turned into ping, shang, chu, ru, and you can see the ru here. These are the four tone categories of not only modern Chinese, but also modern Vietnamese, modern Thai, and modern Burmese. Now we're gonna jump into Burmese in one moment, but let me show you this. So let me use a red, uh, pen here. So these ones here in Thai would be no tone marker. These ones here would be Maitor. So when you see this tone marker in Thai, it doesn't represent a pitch contour. And whether it's Bangkok Thai or Isan Thai or even in Lao, this just represents that this was traditionally one of these ones that had the creaky voice at the end, that had this glottal stop at the end. And so those are Maitor what the actual pitch contour is. It's just like saying, what shape is the cloud today? Well, it depends where you are geographically and clouds change over time. The same with pitch contours. So it just happens that Bangkok Thai, supposing you have this go, ah, uh, and a meitor, in Bangkok Thai, that's ga, but say in Isan, that would be ga. Other dialects, it could go up, it could go down, it depends. Time and geography have changed the actual pitch contour, but the original meaning of this was creaky throat or glottal stop. And then finally, this one in Thai is the Mei'ek tone marker. We have another breakout here. So this is gut. In Thai, we have long and short. And so these are the dead ones. So we would have ga, that's long, dead at the end, ga, ga, or short, ga, ga. Got. Okay, so we're broken down here now. Normal voice, ping, creaky throat, shang or meitor, aspiration at the end, chu, and then dead or stopped at the end, ru. And that's how these boxes are broken down by Marvin Brown. Now we use Gedney boxes now. They've actually got one extra row in there for some Thai dialects where this b, d, and o ang are in their class of their own because the pitch has changed. But basically, for many dialects, we can break it down to this. So in Thai, the reason why we break those into three columns 
is because of three registers of the voice. So the initial, if the initial was aspirated, okay, it would be in this higher register. If it was a stopped throat in the initial, so, so I'll write here stopped, it would be in this middle register. And if it were with a voice, so voiced, the voice would naturally drop down. So if this is like a thing, we have high, mid and low range. That's what becomes high, mid and low class in Thai, which by Bangkok, these have all sort of changed around. Then this is basically the same as what we have in Chinese. We have the yang. So the yang were all of these voiced ones down here. And we have the yin. So these so you've heard of yin and yang before, I'm sure. That's, you see this shape here. Okay, and that's sort of black and you've got the dot there. So these ones up top were all of the unvoiced. So whether it's aspirate or stopped, you don't use the voice. So they're in a higher range, they're yin. And these ones here, yang, they were voiced. So they're in a lower one. So these ones we would actually also call ching. So ching basically means clear. And these ones here with the stop throat were called which were semi-clear, but either way, they didn't use the voice. And so we can see these three registers here actually correspond to the three registers of Thai. So by the way, if we're looking at Vietnamese, this ping is what we know as our ngang tone. So ngang or the huyen tone. Okay, so huyen. So these two tones in Vietnamese, ngang and huyen, correspond with normal voice for here, ngang huyen, ngang huyen, the yin and yang versions of the ping sheng in Chinese. Likewise, the sheng in Chinese is actually the hoi tone. That's the yin version, the higher register version, or the nga tone, which is this broken tone in Hanoi. And that nga was from the lower portion of the voice. As far as the chu or this voiced at the end, that is the sak tone for the high register or the nak tone. So that nak, nak, nak in Vietnamese is the yang version of the chu sheng in Chinese. And then these actually break down the same. So because Vietnamese also has these stopped endings, they correspond to these ones here, which you see very similar correspondences in Thai as well. So if you have a dead syllable with a mei ek, this is also shak and na. And that actually happens with Thai as well. So if I write this word here in Thai, ga with a mei ek, it's ga which is the same as saying ga, dead. Notice that they actually have the same tones, just like with Vietnamese, shak nang, shak nang. They're the same as well. Isn't this mind blowing? But there's one language that is actually going to blow your mind more than any of these. And that's because Burmese is still in its evolutionary stage when it comes to tones. Burmese today is in the tonal evolutionary stage that Chinese, Thai, and Vietnamese were both in thousands of years ago. So we can actually look at modern Burmese like looking at a fossil and we can see exactly how tones have formed. Let me show you. So in Burmese, what happens is now in Thai, we use this as our unaspirated K. In Lao, it's like this. In Hindi, it's like this, or in Devanagari, you can see this. In Khmer, is like this. Okay, so you can see this portion represents these bumps here, uh, where Thai has taken the bottom portion of that. And in Burmese, it's this. So Burmese looks like this top portion, but in bubble right. Now, the reason why Burmese looks like rounded, bubbly, while Khmer looks like these straight lines, is because Khmer was etched in stone, and so they were using chisels and things to etch, and so it needed to have straight lines. Burmese, you see these written on palm leaves. And so if you etched these straight lines in writing in palm leaves, it would rip the leaves. And so by putting 
bubbles in there rather than straight lines, it would preserve the structure of the leaf and it wouldn't break. And so that's why in Burmese, we see it looks very bubbly. Same with the Lana script. So all of these are ka. I just put those there. So if you speak any of these languages, it'll make sense. And so in Burmese, this is, now that's the R vowel. So this would be ka, ka. Now you could say ka, 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 ka. Just like we saw in those early Thai dialects, it doesn't matter, ka, ka, just as long as your voice is in this sort of lowish register, ka, ka, and it's in a normal state, that's going to be the right tone. Then we have what we call the creaky voice. So uh, in Burmese, I don't need to put a tone marker. If there's no vowel after that, it's this ka, ka, ka. Now you remember, in Chinese, we had shang, which was basically the throat has a glottal stop. Ka, ka, ka. So this glottal stop in Burmese, which ends up actually giving it this very sharp shooting down tone. Ka, ka, ka. That is what we call the creaky tone, where this is normal voice. Okay, so normal, which of course would be ping in Chinese. Then we have aspiration at the end and so ka, and so in Burmese they use this to represent aspiration which is the equivalent to chu in Mandarin and so the way this sounds is ka, and there's you also hear some aspiration over it like that ka, ka. now the where the pitch starts isn't as important as in languages like Vietnamese Thai Chinese just as long as it has this sort of falling off at the very end with a bit of aspiration quality. And then we have gap. So that could be something like this. Now, if I write, this is a bar. And if I write this at the end, it basically means that you want to keep that silent, but this means dead. And so I'll write this here, rule. And so that would be now originally gap. But because the glottis in Burmese stops even before the lips hit, that also turns into ga. But then the vowel changes because originally the throat and the lips were there. So that is ga. So have a look at this. I'll do this here too. So this actual tone contour looks very similar to this, but the vowel actually changes. So watch this. Ga, 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 ga. I'll do it once more. Ga, ga, ga. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? So if I were to write that in Thai, that would be ga. Now this could either be ga with a may egg because that means uh, stop throat at the end, or it could be this short vowel. And then I have ga may to and then stop throat. So that could be ga. Okay, so these correspond to these correspond to Chinese, which we saw correspond to the Vietnamese as well. And so these are the tones of Burmese. Have a look. Here we have, now here they've put the creaky first and you can see I've put this and I've actually written in in my pen, this is from a page in a book, uh, with the Vietnamese tones as well. So shang is the hoi and ngā, which correspond to this column. The ngang and huyen correspond to this column, which is the normal voice. The sak and nak correspond to this, which is the final aspiration. Now, when I say final aspiration in Burmese, it's still there today. Over time, that's been lost in Thai and Vietnamese and Chinese, but its footprint has been left on the actual pitch contours that form. And then finally, this stopped or dead end in Thai or the ru sheng in Chinese is the sak and nak and this is what we call a final glottal ending, which could be a final K, P, or T in Burmese, which all of them just get cut off in the throat. Your mouth doesn't even make it to the position of the P, T, K at the end. So that might be A, 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 A. This one could go either way because it's the normal voice. It doesn't matter. And if you hear Burmese people speak, say when they're listing off the tones, maybe they'll do this with a rising pitch. When they're speaking normally, maybe this normal voice will come with a falling pitch. Doesn't matter. Just as long as the voice is in a relaxed position. And this is where the ping sheng in Chinese came from. Now in Mandarin, this ping sheng is the first tone. So ma and the second tone ma. So zhen or even the word ping 
is this lower register ping or normal voice in Chinese. And you'll see in Cantonese, these will always turn into say like a two to one tone. So the word Ren in Cantonese, Yan. Ping in Cantonese, Peng. And th they will always map to these contours, but it's this original normal voice. Now, depending on what the original initial consonant was, it would put it into a different register of the voice, but the voice was in its normal state, just like we see here in this snapshot through Burmese. The voice is in its normal state and the pitch contour could go any way. Let's have a look here. Now, if you read Thai, this is Salai. Here we have it and with the stick. Now, Thai, we put the stick on the side here, the sticks inside. So this is it, e, e, it, it, e, e, it. And see that? Now we have this one here. Oh, now in Thai, the o goes over here. The o is like this stick going down, but you can kind of make it out. O, 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 o. So this dot here is pretty much the mei to in Thai. And these two dots here are like mei e in Thai. And we can just keep going through them like this. This is a, 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 o. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's all about the mechanics of the voice. Ooh, 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 ooh. Or, ooh, 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 ooh. Doesn't matter, especially for this normal voice one. It's the characteristic of the voice that's important, not the pitch contour. So now we can start to understand. Supposing we look at this, this could have gone ooh. Oh, now imagine if that's slowly going and being put in the refrigerator and then the freezer. This is how we get all of the different pitch contours in Chinese, in Vietnamese, in Thai starting to freeze into place then because people get used to hearing it like that. So in English, so I said, what do you want? That just sounds weird. What do you want? That sounds more normal. And so the reason why that sounds normal is just because it became the normal rhythm of the language over time that people got used to. And this is how tones are formed as well. So if you are learning a tonal language, stop counting tones, stop thinking of tones as only pitch contours. It's all about the throat. Get the throat right, the pitch contours will follow. Sometimes you may get the pitch contour correct, maybe for those certain people, but the tone will still be wrong and people may still be left scratching their heads. It's all about the throat. So focus on these mechanics and the pitches will follow and your tones will sound much more natural. If you really want to have your mind blown, go and learn Burmese. It's such an amazing language and it really gives you this depth of understanding of tonal languages because it's still in this initial, like very old evolutionary process of tonal languages. We can see everything still falling into place, which say by modern Chinese, Cantonese, Mandarin, it's already locked in place or even Thai or Thai languages. But you can see it here and you can actually start to map things in your throat that will make you sound more natural in Chinese, in Vietnamese, in Thai. So there you go. Whether it's Chinese, Mandarin, Cantonese, Hokkien, whatever dialect, Vietnamese, Northern, Southern, Lao, Thai, or even Burmese. All of these languages are running on the same tonal engine. They've just changed over geography, they've changed over time, and some languages like Burmese are still in the early evolutionary stages of this tonal shift. But you can see it all here. Tones are not pitch contours. Pitch is a byproduct of tone. I hope this has blown your mind. If you like this kind of stuff, you're gonna love Minecraft. You will master whatever language it is that you're learning, especially if it's tonal. So come and subscribe. Scan the Discord server QR code down below. Come and join in the conversation. I'm Stuart J. Raj. I'll see you on the other side. Yeah.